Welcome back to our little office here. And today we continue with our discussion of trial and error searching. At last we get to science. So here we make it a little more complicated though analytically. So if you look up on the screen, you'll see there's a star, which means this is optional. It doesn't mean you really should ignore it, but it means it might be a little bit harder. It may take several looks. And I thought today we'd start off with a demonstration. Now, I really wanted to bring my spaniel in and have her run around in circles, but we just didn't have enough room. So we figured up some other problem to do. And it turns out we have a real scientific problem. So we'll show today how these same techniques, which we talk even about the very simple problems, are the same methods you use if you were building a bridge, if you were building some structure, how they actually solve those complicated structures. So why don't we go over here now and take a look at this demonstration. Well, here is now a demo to talk about trial and error searching in a real situation. Now, what you should see when you look up here is a river flowing on bottom and a canyon and we want to build a bridge across the river but we're doing it upside down because uh, it's easy to demonstrate okay so we have a length across the river in this case shown by a meter stick which is fixed we know we have two positions say here where it'll be supported and we have a mass on one end here or a weight we have another mass hanging or a weight and we know those values. We know the lengths, we know the geometry, we know where the support towers are if you want. And the question is a very simple problem. How, when we set it up like this, what are the angles that these various lengths make, okay? And what is the tension, in this case in the string, which we're using as our model? Because one is concerned both with how it looks, where you have to place the members, if you were building a bridge, that is, and that the tension in the string or the members never get so high as to break. But also, as you see on a computer when we solve this, uh, you always want the tensions to be positive. The tensions have become negative. If it's a string, string can't have negative tensions. It would just push in and wobble and free in the air. Okay? So we need to know just what it'll be. And when you solve this problem, you can solve it for various masses. And I'll show you here that it's a real problem. So these are just one piece of string. We just have these hangers tied. And as we change the mass, like here, I make this mass less, ooh, the angles change. So even though the geometry, the lengths never change, the angles change as we change the mass. If I change the mass even more at this end, you see, there's another change in the angle, even when it gets static, which is what we care about today. Uh, we have different angles, very small angle. So the angles change, the tensions change, but the lengths never change. Okay? And here we could do something else. We could say, what happens if we really make, say, this mass on this end zero? Whoops, whoops. This is a hard problem to solve numerically or analytically because what happens if we make that mass zero, you see all of the weight here is being suspended from just the top string. This other string is limp. Okay? So on an equation, you, that would be some kind of a limiting case, case where the tension is zero or negative, um, and that's unusual. So we have one angle here. Even if we made mass greater here, this tension still remains zero because it's being supported completely from the top. But the normal problem, the one we'd like you to solve, is when we have two masses hanging, and you'll change the masses, see how that affects the answer. If you go too far from the an right answer, you know it's crazy. And you know, if you want to start off the solution, you can start off as we have it here. The masses are equal, as they are here, even though lengths aren't, but if you made the lengths equal, and I'm not going to do it here because I can't tie knots that quickly. If you made the lengths equal, all the angles should be equal. They should be close to whatever this angle is here. Not quite 90 degrees, uh, a little more than 90, maybe 110, 115 degrees. Okay? So you need a good initial guess. Here's some way of doing it. So now let's go back and talk about how we solve this problem in, with equations, which ultimately means how we solve this problem on a computer. Well, you've seen the demo now. So let's talk about how we solve this problem, how we formulate it, simplify it, make a model, and then how we go about finding numbers and seeing what works.
So here on this first transparency, slide number two, we see a picture of our masses. And it's exactly the same setup as we have over here. We have two weights. We call them W1 and W2. And now the weight is actually a force. It's the force due to gravity. Okay, so that's what's pulling down with these masses. That's what causes the strings to have tension in them. And we call the tensions in the string for weight one, we call that tension T1. The tension connecting weight one and weight two we call T2. And the tension connecting weight two with the meter stick up above we call T3. Those are unknowns. We don't know what the tension is. That's what we have to solve for. Likewise, the three angles here in the picture, theta 1, theta 2, and th theta 3, correspond to the angle up here, the angle up here, and the angle made with the horizontal for the first mass. Those are also un unknown, as, and as we see here, if we move, increase the weight any, the angles change. The lengths never change, but the tension does. As I pull down more here, tension gets larger, as you'd expect. So here's the problem. We have what? Three unknown tensions, and we have three unknown angles. That's one, two, three. Okay? So we have six unknowns to solve for. Can we solve this problem? Well, as you'll see, six unknowns can be a lot, particularly when the equations are not trivial. They're simple to write down. They're not trivial to solve mathematically. So this is a very good example of a number of things. It's an example of how even quite simple problems can be very hard to solve. It's also an example of an unsolvable problem in the classical mathematical sense, which computers can solve them, can find solutions. They can't always find solutions. You can't guarantee it, but that's why this is part of trial and error. So how do we solve this problem? Well, the first thing we do which is what we've done here, is we draw a diagram. That's our model. We have a simple diagram, and we label the variables. So now we know we have six variables we need to solve for. We need at least six equations. So we start writing down what the equations are. Okay. So equations one and equation two here are the geometric constraints. Equation one says quite simply that as you move along the length, you. you how far do we go to the right? We go L1 down at an angle, L2 over at an angle, L3 back up. So as we go from left to right, we just cover a horizontal distance of L. Okay? So L1 times cosine of theta, which is the projection of L1 along the horizontal direction. Think of it upward along the meter stick. L1 cosine of theta 1 plus L2 cosine of theta 2. It's just the horizontal distance in the middle. And then L3 cosine theta 3 is just the horizontal distance for the mass 2 over to the right. All three are positive numbers here. No question about that. Angles can change, but if we write it down carefully and we stick to our notation, it will always be right. So that's the first constraint equation. It's a geometric constraint. One equation down. What other constraints do we have? Well, we have the constraints that as we move down, and to get to the masses, at some point we have to move back up to get up to the meter stick. So the total vertical distance from the beginning here on the left to the end here on the right must be zero. So L1 sine theta, which is the distance down, plus L2 sine theta 2, which is the distance down as drawn here, plus, minus in this case, L3 sine theta 3 because we're going back up Okay, with sine with theta three is indicated here, less than ninety degrees. Okay, so that has to be a negative sign. This is what you have to be careful, is zero. It means total distance down is equal to the total distance up. So those are two equations, they're the geometrical constraints. Okay? Now we have physics at last. Maybe I'm the only one who thinks that, but no. What are, what's the physics here? The physics is Newton's law. And it's just Newton's second law for statics. There's no accelerations. We assume the system's at equilibrium. It's at rest. So the sum of the forces in the x direction must be zero. Likewise, the sum of the forces in the y direction must be zero. And since we're solving the problem in a plane, there's no other components. So we have to balance the x and y forces in two directions for two different masses. So that should give us four more equations. So that will give us six equations which is what we're looking for.
Okay? So let's look at these equations. And you know, when we look at equations, it helps to do as we've tried to do here on the screen for you, which is to break them up into pieces. If you try to look at all six equations at once, it's sort of overwhelming. It looks like a lot of algebra, a lot of letters. But each equation, piece by piece, must make sense. And in fact, any time you solve a problem, ahead of time, you should make sure you understand what the equations are you're putting in. Because unless you understand them, at least how they're derived, at least the conventions here, like angles, you could easily put the wrong numbers in or get numbers out that make no sense and you don't even know about it. So stick with me. There's some value in understanding these equations. They're really not hard. They're high school level. Okay. So equation three, and as I try to indicate on the right-hand side of the equation, balances the forces in the y direction for mass one. Okay. So it says that on mass one here, if we drew a free body diagram, we would just have tension one pulling up, tension two pulling over. Okay? And we say that tension one pulling up, which is T1 sine theta, that's the vertical component. Yep. And uh, t the tension two is pulling down for the angles as indicated. So we have minus T2 times sine of theta two. That must be equal to the weight pulling down because okay, all the forces are balanced. We have tension one pulling up, tension two pulling down, the force of gravity, the force is the weight, mg. That's pulling down. So the sum of all those forces must be zero. That's the first equation. Equation four does exactly the same thing except in the horizontal direction. So there's no gravity in the horizontal direction. You have tension one pulling over to the left. You have tension two pulling over to the right and they must be equal and opposite, or they balance. So T1 times cosine theta, we make that positive, minus T2, cosine theta 2 is zero. We can change the signs, it's going to be zero either case. Likewise, for mass 2, we balance the forces first in the y direction. T2 is involved, its y component. T3 has its y component. Okay, so they're both up. They're both pulling up on the mass, and all that's pulling down is the force of gravity. It enters with the negative sign. It's equation five. And equation six now says two, two forces on mass two pulling to the right and the left must balance, or equal to zero when you sum them up. So T2 cosine theta two, which is T2 here pulling to the left, and then T3, tension in uh, string three, pulling to the right times cosine of theta, its horizontal component difference must be zero. Okay. That's a lot. That's the real physics. Okay. So the real physics is these three equations, four equations, pardon me, equation three to equation six. The geometry is constraint is equations one and two. So we have six equations. We have how many unknowns? We have three unknown tensions and two unknown, three unknown angles. So that's six unknowns. But now we get a little touchy, we get a little bit thoughtful. We say, hmm, well, the equations are really not equations in the unknown angle, theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. They're equations in the unknown sines and cosines of those angles. You may think, yeah, but that's really the same thing. Well, it is the same thing for you and I, because if you know theta, then you know sine theta. But as far as equations go, these are really separate equations for sine theta and cosine theta. They can have different values. So in some sense, and actually the way we solve it on the computer it makes it easier, rather than saying the computer, you have to know the trig functions, you have to know the trigonometric identities, we build that into the problem. So the next step here, we say uh, point four here, we say there are th how many? Three more equations. And that's just the geometrical constraints that says that sine squared theta 1 plus cosine squared theta 1 is equal to 1. Sine squared theta 2 plus cosine squared theta 2 is equal to 1. And sine squared theta 3 and sine plus cosine squared theta 3 equals to 1. So we build that in as three more equations. And now we treat sine theta, cosine theta as independent variables. So that's how we solve the problem. So look at slide 2 again. This is our problem. We have a simple diagram. We now have nine equations to solve for nine unknowns. Hey, this is only two masses. Imagine if we really made you build a bridge and it might have 
a hundred elements, we have exactly the same approach. We would just have hundreds of equations. And you could draw the angles in the same way. You could figure out the equation. They'd be very similar, but it would be very hard to solve. Here, we'll keep looking at slide two. I challenge you to solve these equations by hand, analytically. It's possible, but it, number one, may drive you crazy. Number two, you may end up getting a solution which is so complicated looking that on the one hand, it doesn't do you any good. It's not terribly illuminating. And on the other hand, if you try to evaluate with numbers, you might get the answer wrong because it's a very complicated expression. So we won't even try to wreck our brains by looking for analytic solutions. It's very hard. As you know, sine theta and cosine theta are called uh, transcendental functions. Or they're called, in this case, the equations involved. And we have transcendental equations. These are nonlinear equations. They're just not linear in sine theta and, uh, in theta and cosine theta. They're the product of two unknowns. That makes them very hard. So how do you solve nonlinear equations? Well, let's look at the next slide. Look at slide three. Slide three suggests a technique for extending the newton raphson method of searching to more than one dimensions. So remember, we know how to solve nonlinear equation if there's only one. Can we do it now simultaneously with a whole bunch of equations? Well, for problems such as this, there's no analytic solution you have a choice. Either you try to solve it numerically, you try to solve it with this multi-dimensional search, or you don't solve it at all. So this is really the only way of solving these problems. And we base it on knowing that we know we can solve the one equation. And we just do it to each variable independently and simultaneously, and we'll end up with nine simultaneous equations to search for. Okay? This would be really hard for a spaniel, but computers are good. Okay. So now, we have nine equations to solve for. Uh, we have to be systematic. You know, the angles, the tensions make good sense, but on a computer, we just assume call the variables the same name and give them subscripts. Because then, as far as computer languages go, we can use a subscripted variable, have, write them all down, declare them all at once. It's a much more efficient way of solving the problem. It also makes it much more opaque to outsiders. So only you and not I know how to do this. So here's what we're going to do. So let's look on the left here of slide three, and we're going to say we now have nine variables, x1 to x9, and the order doesn't matter. I've just ordered them this way because I did order them this way. No reason. Okay? So x1 is sine theta 1, x2 is sine theta 2, x3 is sine theta 4. So we have mainly the first one, two, three, six unknowns are the sines and the cosines of all the angles. And then the last three unknowns is what we really wanted to solve for particularly were the three tensions. Okay? So these are the unknowns. And we write it here as a vector, x. Okay? Now, a vector has multiple meanings. You're probably familiar with the term vector from your physics class, meaning a directed arrow pointing here or pointing there like a tension. Okay? In a mathematical sense, uh, a vector is also a column of numbers. So in mathematical sense, we say this is a column vector. And that's what we mean when we say this is a vector. You can, we, we, so we'll put it here in square brackets in order to indicate that it's a vector. It's uh, also the same notation used for matrix. The difference here would be a matrix would have both rows and columns. Here we just have columns. So this is the column vector of the unknowns. That's what there is. So what are the equations now? Okay. Well, we now, on the right of this slide, show you the equations. Go back before you choke on these nine equations, and let, let's look. Remember when we did the bisection algorithm, when we did the Newton's Raphs in one dimension? We always wrote the equations down as finding the root, finding the zero of some function f. Just it gave us a standard form. It gave us a standard mathematical expression. So now we do the same thing here. So we say we have nine equations to solve. And we'll write every one of them in the form as a function f of some variable x. And here the variable x is this vector. 
this array, this nine-dimensional components in a row, and there's nine different values for f, nine different subscripts. And these are the equations. So if you go back to the previous slide and look, you see this is just, you know, the first equation, eight, we've given, we've given the weight one, a value eight, and 20 here in equation five is the other mass. So these are just the vertical components uh -huh, coming in. These are just the horizontal components. And then there's the geometry here as well. And the last three equations are clearly just sine squared plus cosine squared for the three angles. So if you look at these equations, trace them back line by line, you see, yes, here are just the masses. Some of these equations, the equations three through six, have nonlinear terms in them. They have x7 times x1. That's what makes these nonlinear. This is just the tension times the sine or cosine of an angle. But still, as far as mathematics go, that makes these very hard to solve. It makes it very hard to solve by simple substitution. So uh, it's not a set of linear equations, which is what matrices usually deal with, but that's the trick. Okay, so we'll, when we're done, we'll convert these equations into linear equations, but only approximately, and hope we can search for a solution of those, and keep going until we find a solution. So now let's look about how we do that. We talk about that on the next slide, but the answer will be obvious. It's just doing what we did for one dimensions and continuing it now to when we have nine different variables. So let's look at slide four. You're probably thinking, I'm glad he's covered it up. I don't want to look at all that stuff. It gets complicated. We'll go through it slowly. And we don't expect you to understand every equation in detail, but you should be able to sort of understand how we get through it. So let's start off here. Okay. So we have, as we just showed you on the last slide, we have nine equations of the form f sub i and a function of nine variables equals zero. So if you think of it, 9 times 9, that's 81 different sort of terms we have to deal with. But they're nine separate equations, each in nine variables. That's a lot. But when we write it in this nice notation with subscripts for both the functions f and subscripts for the variables x, we don't have to write out all 81 terms. We just write down one equation that says everything. Now, I'll write them down more explicitly for you just because I'm a nice guy and I know you're not used to seeing it this way, maybe, but you don't have to do it. So still here on equation one, that's what we're trying to solve. We don't know what the x's are. We, in other words, we don't know what numerical values they ha have, which when substituted into this equation gives zero. So we're looking for, in a sense, one zero, but in a sense, we're looking for nine different zeros. We want each of the nine equations to be equal to zero for, for one possible set of nine x's. Okay? So that's hard to do. If you think of what we were searching for, I drew that diagram last time with the little arrows going here and there and lines thinking of, oh, that was a tangent, the bisection. Well, here we're in a nine-dimensional space. And it's very hard to visualize walking through nine-dimensional space and drawing tangents and knowing which, which way is up and which way is down. So we do this more analytically than thinking of it geometrically, but some smart people can see this geometrically. Okay, equation one. We're not moving too quickly. Equation one says we're looking for a solution. Nine possible values of x for which each of the nine equations, the f's, is equal to zero. We start off with a guess. So the guess should be a good guess because recall newton robson only works if we're close to the right answer. So knowing what lengths you have uh, for these masses and values for the masses and lengths for the strings, you can draw on a piece of paper what the lengths are, make it accurate, and guess what the angles are pretty well. Okay? You can know, you tell from that. Make a close guess. So that's what we'll, we'll, we'll assume. So here we have the technique. X sub i are the unknowns. The superscript, that's the guy upstairs, indicates what order of guess it is, which is the first guess or the second guess or the third guess. This is, we'll assume you're pretty sophisticated in this because we did it in the last lecture. And we know that we've learned everything in the last lecture before you got to this one. Okay. So equation one here just says that the nth guess is just the previous, or the nth minus one guess, plus some correction. So the capital delta x's 
are always the corrections, as before. Okay? And the x sub i with the n minus 1 is the known previous guess. This is our improved guess. And what we'd like to solve for is the corrections, the delta x's. Those are the unknowns. Ideally, if we do a perfect guess, we'll get the right answer. And we do it by saying, let's assume we're close enough to the right answer as we were before so that we can make a Taylor expansion, equation 2 here, and only keep the first unknown term, the first term that comes in in the delta x's. Leave off everything delta x squared. Okay? So we say f sub i as a function of the nth guess, the next order guess, is just equal to what f, all the f's were, the previous value, it hasn't changed much, and that's the n minus 1th guess, plus what? Plus Taylor expansion. So now we have to use partial derivatives. We say it's how much f changes when we change variable j times the change in variable j, delta x sub j. Okay? So now we, but now we have each function. So we have how much function 1 changes when we change x1, how much function 1 changes when we change x2, and so forth. All a function of all nine variables, and so forth. Okay. So that's the uh, basic expansion. And now we can look at equation 3. Well, you know, equation 3 is really just equation 2 rewritten. A relief, okay? So there's nothing new happening. In fact, we're done with equations. We won't derive any new equations. We'll just mix them together, put them in simpler and simpler forms, because after all, computers are dumb, so we have to give them something simple. Okay? Have, so equation 3 is just a rewritten version of equation 2 going back to what we had in equation 1. We have to write these equations out in some form something equal to 0, so we find a 0. So all we do here is we bring over the, uh, what do we say? We're saying that the left-hand side of equation 2 must be 0. We're assuming, let's assume we've made such a good guess for the unknown delta x sub j's such that the answer is perfect. So if we have a perfect guess, then the f sub i, the nth guess, must just be equal to the right-hand side of the equation, and that's just equal to 0, because that's what we're looking for. So if we have a solution to our problem, then we have equation 3. So if you're the same equation 2, the 0 on the left-hand side, which we now moved over to the right-hand side, because that's the standard way. Okay. So how, well, how many equations is that? Well, those are nine equations here, because for each i we have an equation, but they're, for each f sub i we also have a derivative with respect to x sub j. So there are 81 derivatives to write down. That's a lot to write down, so let's write it down in a matrix form. So equation 4, you see in here it's a compressed form, and if you look in the paper notes, you'll see that we actually do write this down explicitly for all the equations to see at once, but we don't have enough room on the screen here to do that, and I'll get tired of keying all this in a few more times. So, we have here the exact same equation as equation 3, this is equation 4, only now written down in matrix form, which means we have these square brackets and these combination of two square brackets on the right-hand side here, of the right-hand side of the left-hand side. Okay is uh, matrix multiplication. So we have the, the partial derivative of f1 with respect to x1 as the top row, going through all the way to partial derivative of f1 with respect to x sub n, which would be x sub 9, the l last one here. Then f2 with respect to 1, 2, 3, up to x9. And the bottom row would be f9 with respect to f9, or f9 with respect to x1, so there are 81 terms here in this matrix. Okay. So that's, that's the complicated part, but we could write it down as we do on equation 3 or equation 4. In this very simple form, it's very easy to program. The right-hand side of the equation here, of right-hand side or left-hand side, is the vector of unknowns delta x sub i. So that's the matrix multiplication. That's what we need to solve on the computer. It's a linear problem we can do with. You may be asking yourself, okay, what's known and what's not known? So let's go back, look at this equation 4 again and say, we know the f values, because the f values, as we have right above, are evaluated at the previous guess. You know the number for that. But the uh, 
unknowns, here are the F values for F. The derivatives are not known explicitly, but you know the function F. So once you know the function F, that means that you can take the derivative numerically. So down below on the bottom here, equation 5, we say we do the same thing. We evaluate F, say, at some delta x. This is a small delta x in both these equations. They both should be small delta x. And that means the shifted value that you choose by hand, anything you want. And then you divide by that, and that's a good approximation for the derivative. And so we know all the terms in the matrix. We also know then the, uh, the left-hand side here, the, the f's. But we don't know the delta x's. And now we have to go ahead and solve that. Okay? Okay. So now, now that we have equation 4 here, we know everything in this equation except the delta x's. It's a matrix equation. And in a sense, we're done. This is the hard part. One of the things we'll talk about in another lecture is that it's very straightforward to solve matrix equations on computers. Computers are the ideal tool for solving matrix equations. And there are libraries of mathematical routines that do just that. And JAMA is an example of one. We'll talk about that and we'll use it. But we'll show you how to do that some other time. Because I think you have enough here. So I think this is enough. Let's go ahead and see what should you be doing with all this. Okay? We are getting there. We will give you a program that solves this equations for these two masses. Okay? We'll give you that. It's the diagram shown here. And we, two things. For those of you who are overwhelmed already, just play with this equation. Play with it, we mean, in a technical sense. We mean try it out, get a feel, look at it, see if you can make sense of the variables. And so we want you to check the reasonableness of the solution. We want you to look at various values of m and l. So put those in the equation change the masses, change the lengths, and see if reasonable numbers come out. Okay? See if the deduced tensions must always be zero. And the tensions should be approximately equal to the weights. Because you have to add them up in different ways. Something has to be supporting those weights. It should be the tensions. You can use the values we give you in the text for the weights. You can make your own values up. That's fine. And when you're done, make a rough sketch. Just make sure it's reasonable. Finally, part of playing with any code is to try to break it. See what you can do to make the code fail. Make one of the masses zero. We gave you that demo. You should end up with a solution that probably failed because it's very hard to get zero tension and solve those equations. See what happens. If it fails, we're not surprised. Make your initial guess worse and worse. See how it fails. Okay. If you put backtracking in, which is a technique we talk about in the text, you'll see that you can make it more robust. Let the solution be obtained even when the guess isn't so good. But if you do straight newton lofsen you have to be really good. Finally, and this is optional, uh, for those of you who are sort of bored by such a simple problem, take it one step further. The equations are easy to generalize. Solve this problem when you have three masses. So then when you have three masses, you have an extra mass, you have an extra tension, you'll have an extra angles to put in, you get more equations to solve, it gets harder and harder to write it down, it gets a pretty complicated problem, you have to start off with a new guess, it's no, no harder conceptually than a practice it is. So that's optional, but for those of you who are bored, we'll do that. So now, I think, let us now look at slide six. Slide six is interesting. It looks bad, but it's really not. And it shows sort of a very useful and a very powerful technique that many practicing scientists, mathematicians, deal with and or use this technique in order to deal with complicated phenomena. So even though the phenomena gets complicated, you build a mental model. You think of it maybe a little more abstractly, and it's the, then it's the same equations we've always used. You just add the complications, and then you ignore the complications, and you only think of the equations. You probably have no idea what I just said and what I mean, so let me give you an example. Okay, so here's equation one. Equation one was a one-dimensional version of the newton raphson method. And it tells us if we have a function f, we take, know its derivative at some point, we can get a better guess than we had before of where that function passes through zero 
by calculating, as we see in equation one, calculating an improved value for x by an amount delta x. And that improvement is just minus the value of f divided by its derivative. Or written just another way, minus 1 over, or the inverse of the derivative, f prime, times f. And when we spoke about the nonlinear n-dimensional version of this equation, we ended up here with equation 2, which you've seen already. You may not like it, but you've seen it already. It's not new. This is that matrix equation. And we looked at that matrix equation. We said, don't do it yourself. Give it to a scientific subroutine library, and it'll solve it for you. That's right. This is the standard form for a linear simultaneous set of equations where delta x on the right-hand side are the unknown quantities. So now the new thing on this slide is to say, well, you know, equation 2 doesn't look very much like the solution we had for equation 1. And you could say, of course not. Equation 2 has nine dimensions. Equation 1 is one dimension, dummy. You know, they're not the same thing. They have to be the same thing in an abstract sense. So if we look at equation 3, what we have here is to say, how do we solve equation 2 as a matrix? Well, if we look at this big matrix in the middle, it's the only big square matrix here, we can call it anything we want. We can say, well, let's take this equation and multiply every term in it by the inverse of this matrix. If we do that and then just move f over to the other side of the equation, uh, because that's how we get the minus sign as well, we, we see that this, if we multiply this matrix by its inverse, we would just be left with the solution, the delta x's, which is on the left-hand side of equation 3. And then the inverse of this Jacobian matrix, as it's called, times the f's. So equation 3 down below is, in a formal sense at least, the mathematical solution to this problem. And it says the answer, the delta x's, is just the inverse of this f prime matrix times f. And if we look at equation 1, it's exactly the same form. There's the same minus sign. 1 over f prime is the inverse of f prime. This is the inverse of the matrix composed of f primes. And f on the right-hand side is the known function evaluated at the previous guess, the same as equation 1. So equation 1 and equation 3 are really the same equation. That's the fantastic power of abstraction mathematics, which is that they're the same equation except we now have to think of the elements in equation one as matrices. So before we send you on your way to the lab to actually try this, let me say, because it's good computing as well, I call this the formal solution. There's no question it'll, you can solve that equation exactly as indicated on the computer by taking the inverse. And one of the practice programs we give you using Java and the JAMA library, we do it that way to show you it does work. Real applied mathematicians who do this kind of thing for a living say that's usually not a very efficient and possibly not a very accurate way of solving those equations. You should be solving it using a Gaussian elimination technique, which is sort of how you learned how to solve simultaneous equations in high school or elementary school, where you eliminate systematically one variable, substitute into the other, solve for another variable, and lim eliminate it. We do that on the computer, it's a little bit more robust, in other words, won't break down as much, uh, and when you're done, you get the same solution. So, f I wrote this down formally to keep people from yelling at me. The truth be told, for other reasons, we often do solve it with an inverse, because sometimes we need the inverse for another purpose. So, I think we've said enough now, this doesn't change anything we've done before, just gives you another way of looking at it. And that's often what education is about, expanding your mind. So, good. Now that your mind's expanded, let's let your fingers do the talking. Go into the lab and try doing this. <laughs>